Yeah. So if you're using a church Bible, we're going to do our first reading today. Um, it's in John chapter 20, and the page number, when I, and we're reading from chapter 20, we're reading, uh, starting at verse 19, page 1089, okay. Just wait a moment while everybody's managed to turn to it. Page 1089 in the Church Bible, John chapter 20, verse 19. So we've been looking as a church over the last three weeks about the full story of Easter and how it affects us and what it means to us. And last week Alec brought to us the resurrection. Now the resurrection is not an epilogue. It's not the finished bit. And I want you to get hold of that because some, sometimes we just, we, we, in our minds, we think, well, that's the epilogue and that was a fantastic story and what a finish. The resurrection was the total goal of the Lord Jesus Christ entry to this earth. When his death on the cross, his miracles, but the resurrection was the goal, the thing he came for. And that one thing means for me and for you that we have an opportunity to give ourselves to the Lord Jesus and be resurrected on that day when he comes for us. If you want, you can say amen, you can say hallelujah, you can jump up and down or whatever you want. But that is so exciting. It's life changing. Right, if you found page 1089, let's read together from verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, can you, can you just take yourselves into that? You have just witnessed some horrific events. You never really fully understood what Jesus had said. And somehow you've crawled, you've made, you've stepped into a room and you've locked the door. Let's read on. When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jew, Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, the, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord, and my God. We trust God will bless the very precious reading uh, of his word. I've got a bit of a man cult, so I might, I might just use my tissue now and again. Um, you ladies, I know you don't understand just what I'm going through, but, um, but the gentlemen here um, have got every sympathy, I'm sure, no. Let's, um, let's just pray, and then ask God to try and, uh, not to try, but to teach us uh, from these few verses, what he wants you to know and what he wants me to understand for this, these next few days and the start of another week. Father God, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he had a choice. So he could have gone back to heaven before the cross, but he chose not to do. 
he had a choice of not to go into the garden and be cruelly treated, but he, he chose not to do. He had a choice not to be nailed to that cross, but he, he chose to do because that was his goal. He wanted to die for us on the cross. That in 2023, when we come into church, we can hear the, the gospel message of salvation and we can be set free from the, the burden of sin. Help us to understand this today, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. So there's some G's to start with. If, if you're good at G's, if you're, if you're quite young, if you're older, you, you, you'll, you'll be okay with G. There was Galilee and all the miracles. You're with that, aren't you, in, in the early part of the Gospels? There was Gethsemane, the garden where Jesus went to and the disciples slept and where Jesus was arrested. There was Gabbatha. Galilee, Gethsemane, Gabbatha. Gabbatha is the place of judgment. It's where Jesus met with Pilate. It's where Pilate could say, I find no fault in him. <laughs> he's, he's done nothing wrong in normal law. And then there was Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place of Calvary, the place of the cross, the place where Jesus became and was our sacrifice. And, and we've come today um, into verse 19 of a gathering of people. That's the final G, a gathering of the disciples in the upper room. So they came together. Some experts say there were 10. Some say there were 11. Um, I'll leave that to look at the other Gospels and see what you, what you make of that. But each one of them, 10 or 11, came with their own memories. They came with their own feelings. And all of them not knowing which way to turn. Have you ever been in that situation? Not in the upper room, um, particularly. But have you been where you've got your memories? You've got your feelings? And you don't know which way to turn. And you're not sure how you've got to the upper room. Or the place where you've been struggling with. You're not sure how you've made it there. I've driven sometimes. Please don't be alarmed. But I've driven sometimes... Um, one instance was when I went to Birmingham, and I have no idea how I, when I came off at the right junction. My mind was somewhere else. I hope I was safe, and I think I was. But have you ever been in that situation where you've arrived somewhere, and you're just not exactly sure exa how you've made it there? Think about the disciples. I'm just imagining, my imagination, one individual says to another, are we safe? Is that, is that door bolted? I imagine him going across to it. I, I'd be doing this and just, I think it's all right. Do you think the Jewish leaders will come today? Do you think they know we're meeting here? And somebody else shouts up, oh, I've heard that Mary, um, she says she's seen him. She's spoken with him. And then two more individuals, they haven't been there long, they, they say, we met with him on the road to Emmaus. Can you imagine the conversation? Well, I haven't seen him. Do you think they've seen the right one? Do you think they've seen the main one? Do you think they've seen the individual that we all know? Just as they're having a conversation, I find this bit amazing, it's just me. I'm easily, I'm easily moved uh, in stories like this and true stories. But just as you put the first one up for us, Johnny, if, if you will. Thank you. Maybe. Yeah. They're having a conversation. They're talking about Jesus. And he's there. The doors were locked. So you say, with your, with your finite mind, your earthly mind, like me, impossible, can't be. Because you're just thinking as one human being. God is spirit. That's why I believe in him. Can be anywhere, at any time, at any place, in any situation. 
so we would recognize God, God sent Jesus to be born as a baby, a human being. He's been to the cross. He's been to the tomb. Miraculously, this takes a lot of faith to believe, but he's come back to life. Just imagine, Angela, you're, you're in that upper room and you say to the person next to you, do you think it's him? Jesus just says this once, peace be with you. He could have said, where you lot been? Where did you run off to? Why did you fail me? Why were you frightened? Why did you let me down? Do you know God deals with me the same way and he deals with you when you've done things that are wrong, when you've made mistakes? He doesn't come out with all the problems and, and the bad answers and the bad character about you. He just says, peace be with you. Four words that would bring these individuals a warmth in their heart. Peace be with you. But before he says anything else, he gives an object lesson. Because he knew what, if you were in that upper room, like the disciples, he knew what they were thinking. He can't have come back to life, can he? It's not happened before, has it? It's impossible, surely. And he went to one, and he pulled back his garment, and he showed them his left hand. It could have been his right hand. And there was the bruise, and the torn skin, and, 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 and the nastiness of the, of the wound that hadn't quite healed, and they, they would say to themselves, oh, they wouldn't understand how it come back to life, but they'd recognize for a minute that he'd been on the cross. He, he turned to the other side of the room, and he opened up his, his shirt or his robe, and there it was all, all split with a, with a sword from the soldier. Anybody that didn't believe would certainly have changed the mind. See, when he said, peace be with you, it was a voice from the grave. It was a voice from the tomb. And these four words just really came right into the center of their beings. They'd lost hope. They'd lost sight. They didn't know what to do next. Have you ever been like that? You're just not sure what to do next. You've got to a certain age. And up till now, everything's been okay. You know, it's school, maybe relationship, job, maybe marriage, home. And you get to the next thing and you think, I'm just not. Maybe your children are grown up. And you're not sure what to do next. Well, Jesus has been taken out of the equation. And, and they just didn't know what to do. And then Jesus comes into their, into their very being. And he speaks with them. And all of a sudden they began to realize it's not over. It's the beginning. It's the start. It's a new beginning. I think the first point I want to make is this. When Jesus comes into a room, everything changes. When he comes into your bedroom, when you're living on your own, and you're struggling with your health, or you're just not sure where the next payment is coming from. And if you have a faith in God and in the Lord Jesus, when he comes alongside you, everything changes. No, everything doesn't, is not taken away and you're given a, a, a bag of gold, but you're given some hope to get through the night, to face the darkness. And to come through the storm. That's the difference Jesus makes when he comes into our room, into our space. You see, he showed them his hands that were bruised and they were blooded and they were battered. These were the same hands that flung stars into space. That's what the, 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 the Sunday school song says. These were the hands that were the creating the whole universe and the world. And these were the human hands of the Lord Jesus that were marked and nailed 
to a cross. And then Jesus, if you look down the verse, you'll see this for yourself. Jesus repeats the same four words. Peace be with you. So come on, join in with me now. Who is the most peaceful person here today? Oh, you sat very calm. I must admit, you look intelligent. We've got some lovely young faces and, and some beautiful and handsome people, and, I, and I'm not being dishonest. We've got one or two slightly older ones as well. But when you leave this space, and I know what it's like because I've been married for a long time, and when I leave with Elaine today, and she's here today, she might say one thing to me, and I'm not ready for it, or I might so say something to her, and she's not ready for what I say, and all of a sudden there's this, I mean, it's not always like this, but there's this like sort of unease, and it's not peaceful. And I think she's wrong, and she knows <laughs> I'm wrong, But I'm making light of what sometimes you go back to today where there's not peace. There's some anti-peace in your family. There's some, and it's not peace, but, but it's anxiety. It's, it's unrest. Now, we've, we've got to try and get hold of this. We can feel and sense the presence of Jesus here this morning. When the Prince of Peace steps out of the tomb, because that's what he's called in Isaiah, he's called the Prince of Peace. He's the peacemaker. When he steps out of the tomb and he moves towards those people that he loves, he takes with him a message of hope for the weary. He brings light to those in a dark place. And he brings comfort to those when their plans seem to have taken a nosedive. You've had them plans? The new house? Yeah? Or the holiday? Or the new job? Or the new relationship? And it's just taking a nosedive. And you feel like absolute rubbish. And sometimes if you've got a faith in God, you almost say to God, what on earth are you doing? What is happening? What, what is going on in my life? I guess Jesus would remind these disciples two things. Have you forgotten what I said to you in John, John chapter 14 and verse 27? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I, I love that. I just love that. When I'm in the wrong, which is sadly a bit too too often and when things are not good and when things are pu pushing against you um, when I get a quiet moment I can just take hold of that verse my peace I leave with you Philip but my peace I don't only leave it with you I give it to you from the peacemaker from the prince of peace and he would say to the disciples have you forgotten John 16 and verse 33 and this is what the verse says. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this, notice this bit. In this world you will have trouble. I'm not trying to discourage you. If you've got a faith in God, that's what you need to take you through. But you will have problems. You will have trouble. That's what he said to the disciples. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The victory is in the Lord Jesus. The battle has been won on the cross, in the resurrection. Peace, in Galatians 5, is a fruit of the Spirit. It's sometimes a fruit that's not often used. It's sometimes a fruit that's not often experienced. Because I know in a situation, 
if I think I'm right, I want to say to whoever it might be, well, actually, you're wrong. That might be the case, and it might not. But peace is a fruit of the Spirit that Jesus wants his disciples to get hold of as they're in the upper room, as the door is locked. And he's saying, you're frightened of those leaders. You're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Listen, I'm going, but I want you to have peace. Not 30-second peace, not half-a-day peace, but genuine 24-7 peace because he's in you in every situation. If you want just some encouragement and advice, turn in your Bible to Romans 8 and verse 6 and just listen to what Paul says, and we'll just read that together. Romans 8. I'm not just sure what page it is in the church Bible uh, for a minute. Romans 8, verse 6. Okay? So Paul is telling people um, basically how to live um, a spirit-filled life. And this is, this is really applicable to the next point that we have in the story in John 20. I'm going to read from verse 5 of, of Romans chapter 8. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But listen to this bit, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. If you're struggling, as I often do, with how to be peaceable and peaceful, it's a mind control that Satan tries to distort, but Jesus wants us to remember that if we control our mind with thoughts of the Lord Jesus and his love and his truth and his mercy, then peace will be fulfilled in our everyday existence. Colossians 3 verse 15 says this, let the peace of Christ rule our heart. Okay, let's just um, move this on. Peace be with you. I want you to imagine just for a, a couple of minutes. There are some people you wouldn't want to be locked in a room with. When I was not so well a few years ago, um, somebody came to see me and they meant, they meant ever, so, ever so well. But my, my head wasn't there. My mind just wasn't there. And I just wanted him to go. And I didn't, I didn't mean, I, didn't, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just, it just wasn't the right, I didn't want to be locked in with them. I've been to see people in hospital on many different occasions. And I've known when I've been there over a minute that the face picture they're giving me is, thank you for coming, but will you go? Here we've got a situation that Jesus has come to spend time after being on the cross, after being resurrected, after, after the, the, the tomb and, and resurrection. And he's appeared to some people and he's come right into this room that was locked. They didn't expect him. When you're locked in with Jesus, the first thing that we learn is this. There's no way out. There's no way out until you confess to him. He's not going to lock you up and say, I'm going to make you be a Christian. I'm going to make you follow me. I'm going to make you be boring or, or whatever it might be. He doesn't do that. What he says is this. I died on the cross for you. I've risen again for you. 
And if you place your trust in me and ask me to forgive your sins and let me come and live in you, I will come back for you. That's what he says. But it's your choice. You can come to church like you're doing this morning and you can say, not for me. That's okay. Or you can say, I'm going to leave it a bit longer till I'm, till I'm surer, till I'm more positive. As you say that, the devil or Satan will try and persuade you that that's a good decision. Or you can say, I realize my life's messed up. I realize I need a new beginning. I realize I need to put my trust in something that's secure. I realize that I need to just place myself in the hands that bore my sins on the cross at Calvary. They were face to face with Jesus. And this is what he says to them. I'm going to read it again for you now. It says this, they're locked in with Jesus, and it's in verse 21 of John chapter 20. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. That's it. Sorry, John. I beat you. You have to go back again. That's it. Look at the, uh, look at the different nations uh, there, if you can. Just a few individuals. And this is, this is the message that Jesus gave to those few young individuals in that room. He uses the word apostle, sent. What he says is this. 33 years ago, God sent me to this world. You know about the virgin birth? You believe it or you don't believe it. It had to be that way so that it, the, the, the life of Jesus wasn't tarnished. 33 years ago, he would say, God sent me to be born in a stable, to live in Nazareth, to grow up as a carpenter's son, to teach in the temple, to walk into Galilee, to do these miracles so that some people would recognize me as the Messiah, as the Son of God. He knew he was going to die at the age of 33. He knew he was going to go to the cross. He said, God has sent me. Look at verse 21 again for yourself. He said, now I am sending you. God has sent me. I am sending you. What did he mean by that? He means, I think, simply this. To take the message of the gospel and spread it to every land. Jordan. Galilee. Jerusalem. Palestine. Pakistan. India. Africa. Europe. And I, I have to pinch myself when I think about this. How can those few, 11 or so people, with the families. Some were executed. Others died a good old age. But they all witnessed and testified that Jesus Christ is Lord. How, how did it come to India? How did it come to the UK? How did it come to Europe? How, how did these things? Because God was in it. And to a small group of people in a church in 2023 in Castleford... You, you are not here this morning by your own choice. I, I mean, you are. I don't think anybody's absolutely made you come. But God wants you here. Not to listen to me. But he wants you to listen to him. I cannot do anything to help you in my own strength. And, you, and you're saying just now, you mean to tell me... You want me to listen that God wants to send me. Listen, it might be that there's a house in your street. There's a daughter in your family. There's an auntie in your, that's never really understood the gospel. And that's why you're here today. Because God wants you to take the message. This is the challenge of Easter. The message of Easter. It's one of victory. It's one of resurrection. But it's also one of 
being sent. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. The challenge has never been greater. The need has never been more urgent. The time has never been so short. It's not a Churchill speech, by the way. But will you share in that challenge of sharing your faith with those God brings into your space? And that's what it's about, your space. Where you are, God wants to use you as that signpost to point people to Jesus. Whether you are 20, 30, 60, 70, the, the number doesn't matter as long as God is in your life. Matthew 9 and verse 37 says this, the workers are few, but their harvest is plentiful. Just look on the streets of Castleford. Just look on the streets of Wakefield. People are desperate for food. They're addicted to so many different things. And without trying to be glib, the only thing that can help them is the Lord Jesus. The only thing. You might say, I'm not brave enough to go. And, well, maybe it's not for you. But you can pray that someone close by or someone nearby can help us in that situation. Acts chapter 8, Philip, he went on a journey when the church was, was massive and it was growing and people were coming to the Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit said to him, I want you to go and speak to one man. If it had been me uh, with the same name, I might have been saying, can't you send somebody else? I'm enjoying it here, it's, it's, it's good. And I've not been that way before. And, and can you imagine when he's in the desert and there's these chariots appro approaching and he runs alongside the chariot. And it, but you see, God stopped the chariot, stopped the man. And he said, can you explain Isaiah to me? In other words, can you explain God to me? Can you explain God's love? And Philip said, yes, I can. And that man was saved and he was baptized. Where is God sending you? Before we can go and share our faith with somebody, we, we need to have a faith to share. And that faith comes by coming to the cross this morning, coming before the Lord Jesus and saying, look, Lord Jesus, I'm not the person I ought to be. But I want to give myself to you today. I can't manage anymore in my own strength. I just have to come to you. And you know what? If you, if you say that prayer, if you do that just now where you are, he won't say, well, actually, you're not ready. Oh, and I've seen what you like when you're not here. He'll just say this to you. Come. Come and believe. And come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's just pray together. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to talk afterwards about becoming a Christian, then please don't hesitate to do that. If you want to know more about faith in the Lord Jesus, then come and ask. And don't forget the, the breakthrough Bible study tonight. That we'll just, like-minded people with problems, with difficulties, we'll just share together and grow together. Father, we thank you that you went into that locked room. There isn't a room that you can't enter in our life. There isn't a place that you can't get into. There isn't a thought in our mind that, that you don't have access to. You know everything there is to know about us. And you love us just the same. Thank you for going to the cross for us. Thank you for dying for us. And thank you for coming back to life and being resurrected so that we will have hope that one day we shall see you as you are and we shall be taken to heaven to be with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help us to put our trust in you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.